Bibles in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, we'll read from verse 9 to verse 10. But before we read that, Bazaar, let me just give you a little bit of a background uh, about which way we are going or what the Lord is saying or what has placed in my heart for this season that we are in as a church. Um, um, you know, the, the, the Lord has, you know, placed in my heart. You know, I had a, I had a different message that I prepared for today. Um, but the Lord has placed in my heart that we need to uh, revisit the subject of the kingdom of God, Bazan. Hallelujah. Um, and we will be having a lot of series that are related to the kingdom of God. It's such a big topic. It's such a big subject uh, that we could take the whole year just talking about the kingdom of God. So we'll just have different series on the kingdom of God. And this particular one that we are starting today, Bazalwan, um, the main subject is let your kingdom come. But there'll be many other subtitles under this one. But the main one is <coughs> let your kingdom come. Hallelujah, Bazalwan. Mm -hmm. Now, just in simple terms, you know, if you were to ask me what is the kingdom, uh, to give you a short answer, uh, when, when you ask me what is the kingdom, the kingdom is everywhere where the will of God is being exercised. Mm -hmm. That's just a simple way of describing what the kingdom is. Uh, there are many layers to this definition, but if you were to just ask me a very, very simple definition, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where the will of God is being exercised 100%. Mm -hmm. That's really what the kingdom is, Bazaar. Now, in, on the basis of that definition that says the kingdom of God is where the will of God is being exercised, I now want us to go and read in the book of Matthew chapter 6, bearing in mind, Bazan Muti, prior to this, Jesus was teaching them about prayer. You know, he says, when you pray, don't pray like the others do. You know, they like to stand in places where they can be seen and they shout out loud. And he says, when you pray, go to your private place and pray. So he was teaching them about all these things. And then they were saying to him, please teach us how to pray. So when we read uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to verse 10, is when Jesus is actually telling them when they pray, how they should pray. So uh, I would like someone who's uh, sitting next to a mic to read for us. Matthew chapter 6, uh, in the New King James Version, Bazara, um, verse 9 to verse 10. How does Jesus say to them they must pray? In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you please repeat that verse again, Tim? In this manner, therefore, pray. In, Our Father. In this manner, Therefore, pray. Therefore, he's saying, when you pray, this is how you ought to pray. Are we together, Raza? Mm -hmm. And then what is the first thing that he says when you pray, you must say? Our Father in heaven, yes. hallowed be your name. Now, when you look at that statement, Raza, I've always said, it's, he's teaching us how to pray. But when you say, our Father who art in heaven, you have not actually begun to pray. Let me just try and explain what I mean. Prayer is, is, is yes, you're having a conversation. But if you read in many places in the Bible, whenever someone was asking for something, like, for example, Elijah, when she was with the widow woman, she said, please get me some water, I pray. You understand that? And as the widow woman was getting the water, he then said, no, before you get me water, please make me a piece of cake and bring it to me, I pray. Meaning, it's, prayer is some sort of a request. We know that, Bazan. Eh? Mm -hmm. So you can also look at praying as a form of a request. But when he says, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He's just saying, this is how you introduce your prayer. You don't just pray and just start asking, can I please have this? Can I please have that? Can I please? No, no. You say who it is that you are addressing. Are we clear, Bazan? Mm -hmm. You must make it clear who it is that you are talking to. Because you might be saying these things, we are praying to your ancestors, we are praying to Buddha. You must be clear who it is that you are directing this conversation to. 
So that's, that is what Jesus is trying to teach them. You must show who it is that you are praying to. That is why often when you hear us pray, we often say, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Because we are making it clear so that the elements in the spiritual realm can know who it is that we are talking to. Are you with me, Azam? You don't just close your eyes and say, Father, can I please have bread tomorrow? Who is that Father? You must specify who it is that you are praying to. Are we together, Azam? Now, when you read verse 10, now, now the prayer starts in verse 10. What does it say? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But in other words, according to Jesus, when you pray, the first thing you must ask for, the very first thing you must ask for is for his kingdom to come. Not what you want, not what you desire, his kingdom must come first. And then the second thing he says, you let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But then it's like God has revealed this thing about the kingdom coming to me in a very new way. And you will hear over the next couple of weeks when we talk about it, what it is that I'm referring to. So he's saying, let your kingdom come. And we said the kingdom of God in a simple definition, it's where the will of God is exercised. Are we together, Basalwana? Mm -hmm. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. Now, Basalwana, um, when you think about a kingdom, when Jesus came, the Bible says Jesus came just at the right time. Time to go to the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and I'll try and explain a few things. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Please bear with me, Basalwana. This is not the main crux of my message, but I need to just lay this foundation. So don't lose me. Please, please, please stay attentive. Galatians 4, verse 4 to 5. But when, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Read verse 4 again. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. But in the fullness of time, other translations say, but at the right time. So Jesus was not sent at any other time, but he was sent just at the right time. Now, there are certain things that I, I, I want to explain, um, which... Um, I think, uh, you know, whenever you talk about the kingdom, uh, one of the forefront teachers about the message of the kingdom is Dr. Miles Mundro. One of the things he says about this verse, he says when the Bible talks about in the fullness of time or at the right time, certain things had to be happening on earth before Jesus could come. Now, one of those things was the operation of the Roman Empire at the time, Barcelona. the Roman Empire had certain things which made it ready for Jesus to come into earth. Now, you have to understand how the Roman Empire worked. Remember, we're talking about let your kingdom come. The Roman Empire used to work in a slightly different way to how other kingdoms used to operate. Now, remember, when you read in the history of the Bible, you will understand that every time Kings would go to a war with a nation and then they would bring slaves back into their home country. Right? We know the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves again during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Every time a king went, they would plunder. They would take all the cattle, all the sheep, all the women and all the men and they would bring them into their kingdom. That's how kingdoms used to operate. But the Roman kingdom started a different system. A system of colonization. So when Rome took over a nation, they never took the people away from there. Instead, they brought Rome and established the Roman colony there. Do you understand it, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So their system was, they never took people to Italy because Italy was small. So what they did everywhere where they took over, 
they established the Roman Empire. So even when Jesus came, the place that they were in, in Jerusalem, where the Jews were living, was under the Roman Empire. Are you with me, Brother? So the Roman Empire sent someone who was a delegate to represent Caesar there. Are you with me, Brother? So everywhere, so in other words, they would change the architecture, they would change the culture, they would change the law, so that the Roman law is the one that operates in that country. They would even go to the place of even trying to change the language of the people. Do you understand, Basel? Okay. So it was a different way of operating. What were they doing? They were introducing the kingdom of Rome in different countries. Are you with me, Basel? So this is one of the things that was made Jesus' arrival on earth to be perfect because there was a kingdom, the most powerful kingdom at that time. They were not going and taking people into their own land, but they were going to the people's land and changing that land and making it operate like Rome. Do you understand that, Pastor? Mm -hmm. We are talking kingdom language, so you must try whatever I'm saying, filter it through this thing of the kingdom. So they did not take slaves, but they established a Roman kingdom wherever they are. That's one of the reasons why they spread so quickly, Bazaar. Because whenever they go, they would send Rome and every, you know, Bazaar, even with us. So other countries followed suit. When you go to places like the Bahamas and Trinidad, and everywhere they speak English, they, they used to raise the British flag. Why? Because Britain took their culture there. The people in, in, the, in the Caribbean drink tea. They, for the simple reason that their slave masters used to make them drink tea. They speak English, which is not the native language there, because Britain took British culture and imposed it there. Whatever the law was in Britain became the law in Trinidad. It's the same thing. The reason why we drive on the left is because of the British Empire. It's all of the effect of the kingdom of Britain, the way we are living, the way we are. Do you understand me, Basan? Mm -hmm. So this is, was the perfect time for Jesus to come. You will understand, Basan, where I'm trying to go with this. Now, in order for us to have the greatest impact, Basan, as individuals, because we are in a kingdom now, we have to be walking and we have to be doing things in line with the will of the Father. Whenever we are doing things in line with the will of the Father, then we are definitely saying the kingdom of God has come. Hallelujah, Basel. Amen. Are we still together, Basel? Hallelujah. I feel like I'm talking to myself. And if I'm talking to myself, you must tell me. We don't understand you, please. So I can start afresh. <laughs> Hallelujah, Basel. To have the greatest impact and to have support from the kingdom above, we have to do things according to his will. Now, here's a verse that is often misunderstood. Romans 8.28, which we all love. Let's go there, Basel. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So I can try and get to the meat of what the Lord has placed in my heart. And we, all, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to the according to his purpose. The Bible says now we know. What do we know, Basel? We know that all things work together for good. Yes. Yes. It's a very famous scripture. Yes. Yes. And the sad thing is that when we read the scripture, most of us stop there. Yes. Are you with me, Basel? We say all things are, but then you know, all things work together for good. And we stop there. But that's not the whole scripture. What does the whole scripture say? Turn or read it again. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Okay. So let's ask the questions. Do all things work together for good? Do, things, do all things work together for good for all Christians? No. For everyone? No. Who, 
to whom do all things work together for good? To those who love God, number one. Number two, who are called according to his purpose. So you can't claim this verse unless you do these two other things. Are you with me, Mazar? Mm -hmm. You can't claim that whatever happens in my life, whether it's good or bad, because usually we say these things when things are bad. We say not all things are working together for the good. No, no. Sometimes things are not working together because you've made mistakes. Because you don't love God and because you are not walking in accordance with his purpose. That is why I said for us to make the biggest impact, we have to be in line with the purpose of God. So I want to say that some of us are in trouble not because of what God is doing in our lives, but because we've made wrong decisions. Are you with me, Bazaar? Yeah. And let me tell you something. You know, admission of guilt or admission that you were wrong is the first step to true recovery. Because every time you blame everyone else, your cousin and your uncle and your mother and your father, and not looking at yourself, you're not helping yourself to deal with the problem that you are faced with. Amen. Are you with me, Mazar? Amen. So not all problems that we face are because we are in the kingdom. Some of the problems that we are facing are because we have made wrong decisions. And the quicker we can realize that these things are our fault, the quicker we'll be able to get out of there. I wish was a, the man who says, uh, you know, the reason why I drink is because of my friends. You are a long way from getting your breakthrough. Until you say, I am the problem. I am the one that needs to deal with this. Then you will find the breakthrough. Then you are on your way. The journey starts, you know, the journey to recovery starts, Mazalwan, when we accept that there are certain things that we have done wrong. There's a statement I've said in the past, which I'll repeat this morning. I've said to you before, decisions that you make determine direction. And the direction that you take determines your destiny. Are you with me, Mazar? Decisions determine direction, and direction determines your destiny. So where you are, where you find yourself today, you know, my spiritual father used to say this a lot. He says, wherever you find yourself today, it's the sum of all the decisions that you've taken in life. Amen. Are you with me, Mazar? You are the sum total of all the decisions that you've made in life. Are you with me, Mazar? Because decisions determine direction, and direction determines your destination. Hallelujah, Mazar. Now, why am I talking about all of this, Mazar? It's because the Lord has put in my heart, and I know we're talking about the kingdom, but the Lord wants me to talk about the kingdom and talk about death at the same time. Can someone say amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> I know that we have spoken about some of these things before. Uh, and I don't know why the Lord has put this in my heart, but I believe the reason why the Lord wants me to talk about his kingdom and talk about death, it means that it's a problem in this church. Are you with me, Pastor? You may not like what I say, but I'm going to say what the Spirit has put in my heart, Pastor. If the Lord is saying to me, and I say, but Lord, I've spoken about these things before. No, I can't say what I want to say. I must say what the Lord leads me to say. Maybe it's a reason. Maybe it's something that we all are struggling with in this church and that's why the Lord wants us to talk about death. And I'm saying, and I remember where I started this thing. I said, Bazalone, uh, some problems are not in our life. They are in, so some of the problems that we have in our lives are because of the decisions that we have made. That's where I started, I yeah. And now I want to talk about death. And I said, some things you must acknowledge in order for you to solve them. You must acknowledge that you are the cause of some of those problems. Amen. Are you with me, Bazaar? Amen. I don't know if you're gonna, you still want to love me after this, but it's okay. Uh, if you don't love me, you don't love what God is saying to you as the church. 
Hallelujah, Mr. Amen. Amen. Now there are a few things I want us to, to talk about. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 23. Now, when you Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19 and 20. Um, I believe God wants to revive us in this area. I know some of us are doing better than others, but Bazaar, there's a reason why God wants us to talk about this. Uh, I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure there's something he wants to do in our lives, and that's why we're talking about this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, we're going to read from verse 19 to verse 20. But before we read, when you read the book of the Old Testament, when you read the law, God was trying to reveal his character, was trying to reveal how he, how he is and the things that he wishes for those who are called by his name. So when you read that, um, just read for us. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19 to 20. You shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food, or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest, but to your brother, you shall not charge interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. Mm. Can you please read that again, 19 and 20. You shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food, or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest, but you to your brother, you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. Baza, I don't know how much you understand how much this is kingdom language. Because the Lord says, you know, I'm trying if 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 things were done according to my will as your father, this is what I would want you to do. He is saying. In verse 19, he says, you shall not charge interest to your brother. Because interest is not a good thing to be charged to your own brother. Are you with me, Bazaar? Okay. And then he continues and he says in the same verse, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. And then he says, however, verse 20, to the foreigner, you may charge interest. Now remember, who is a foreigner? A foreigner is someone who does not have citizenship of the country that you belong to. So this is kingdom language. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So in our, in, in God's kingdom, no one should be charged interest. So in, by right, we should be using interest against those people who are outside of the kingdom, but not for those who are in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. God is revealing his heart. He's revealing how he operates. In my kingdom, I don't want anyone to be subjected to interest. No one must be subjected to interest. It's only people who are on the outside of this kingdom, who are not kingdom sons, who can be subjected to interest. Are you with me, Bazaar? Yes. Now go and read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, because of time. I actually want us to read verse 1 to verse 12, but because of time we won't get there. He is giving them. So, so just read verse 1, at times, just to give an introduction. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. So the introduction of this chapter, was around. God is saying to them, if you do certain things, certain things are going to happen. Are we clear, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. If you do certain things, which is to, to go according to my principles, meaning if you live in line with my kingdom principles, certain things are going to happen to you. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. And then he lists all the things. You'll be blessed going in, blessed going out, blessed in the field, blessed in your womb. And he mentions all of these things. And then verse 12 he says something about how children in his kingdom are supposed to operate. What does it say? The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all, all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations 
but you shall not borrow. So for his kingdom children, the perfect will of God is that you are supposed to lend to many nations, but you must not borrow. That is the perfect will of the Father for his kingdom. Are you with me, Mazar? Yeah. For those who are called his children, if they live in accordance with his commands, he says, you will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. What does this give us a hint? The Lord does not want us to borrow. Is that not the case? He doesn't want us to borrow. Instead, he wants us to lend to others. That is his perfect will for us. Now, if you go to the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 8, let's just cement this thing, and then we'll come back to the children of Israel. Romans, chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. The Bible says what, Tana? Owe no one anything. Owe no one anything yes except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law you know Bazana, if if we're still under the time of the law and i were to read this verse and ask you are you going to heaven i don't know how many of us here would say yes lord i'm i'm going to heaven are you with me, Bazana? The Bible says, oh, no man, nothing except love. Hey, but we owe. Yeah. We owe men left, right, mm. and sent. We owe. And yet the Father says, no, don't owe any man anything. And you know, Bazan, you know the reason why it's, this thing is, is normal for us? We don't understand the type of kingdom that we belong in. And that is why I believe the Lord wants to reopen our eyes or reinvigorate this thing about this kingdom that we belong in. Let's go back to the children of Israel. When God was giving them these laws in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Leviticus, you need to understand, Bazala, they had been, in, they had been enslaved for 400 years. Now, I want you to understand what happens to a people when they have been enslaved for 400 years. It means the people that left Egypt, the people that left Egypt, Bazaar, all of them were born into slavery. You understand that? There was no one of them who came outside. They were all born in Egypt. I mean, if it was 400 years, it's at least four generations of people that have passed on. The people that left Egypt, all were born into slavery. They were born with a master above them. They were born with someone always telling them what to do, when to do it, you know, what, what you can wear, what you can't wear. They were always being told what to do. So when God took them out of Egypt, he had to change their mindset. You are no longer under this type of kingdom. And remember that in the book of Corinthians, the Bible says the things that happened to Israel happened as examples for us whose time, whom the, the ends of time have come. So we need to learn from them because the things that happened to them happened as examples. So when they came out, they came out with a slave mentality. And the mentality of a slave is to wait for your master to tell you what to do. The mentality of a slave does not question things. When, whenever things are done, when they are born and things are done like this in Egypt, they carry on doing them the same thing, the same way rather, Bazaar. Because a slave mentality is a, is a lazy mind. It doesn't like to think for itself. The master thinks for you. When you try to think as a slave, they say, I don't pay you to think. Have you ever had those types of bosses? I don't pay you to think. I pay you to work. They want to drive that so that you don't think independently. Before you do anything, you must be told. So God was giving them these rules to remove the slave mentality into them. Are we together, Basel? Amen. You know, Mama Tunja spoke about something today that resonated. Uh, he spoke about David. 
And he said, when David was given certain things, when he walked, he was struggling because he was not used. Mm. You know, there are certain things that we have gotten so used to. Mm. We have gotten so used to living in this lifestyle. It's difficult for us to move into this new lifestyle that God is calling us unto. Are you with me, Mazar? We are so used to living in debt. We are so used to borrowing. Mm. That when I say to you, God does not want you to live in debt, hey, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Why? You are not used to. You are used to something else. You are in a comfort zone because the bank will give you credit. Are you with me, Bazaar? Yeah. And yet the perfect will of the Father is that we all know one, Bazaar. Amen has disappeared. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah, Pastor. Let's carry on, Pastor. There's no other message <laughs> except this one. Now, there, there is this kind of mentality, Pastor, that we've shared about before. That, you know, when you take an elephant from the wild, now I don't know if this is true, but it's something I've read. When you take an elephant from the wild and you chain it somewhere, for the first couple of months, it will try to escape. It will try to escape and then realize I've got this chain holding me. And then they say eventually, in its mind, it gets used to being chained. That even when you, you've unchained the elephant, he still only walks in this circle because he's used to operating in that environment. Are you with me, Mazara? This is the same thing with us with death, Mazara. We are so used to operating and assisting. It's become second nature to us. We don't even question it. It's normal for us to go into debt, Pastor. It's normal. And we need the Lord to help us address some of these things. I want to tell you reasons that I believe God does not want us to go into debt. Hallelujah, Pastor. Amen. Number one, debt makes us into slaves. Amen. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Let us read the verse. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a is servant to the lender. Hallelujah. Amen. Who's, whose version talks about a slave? Because this thing of seven sounds too nice. I want it to be in our hearts and our minds that the Bible is talking about slavery. Who's got it, brother? Proverbs 22, verse 7. And this is Zoom. You can read it even in Zoom. Hmm. What is this? Slaves. Could it be true that I'm sitting amongst slaves here? Could it be true that I'm sitting in the presence of slaves who call themselves kingdom children, who call themselves sons of the Most High God, and yet you are sitting here, you are slaves? Hallelujah, sir. Amen. The Bible says, the rich rule over the poor. And the one who lends is a slave to the one that he lends from. I don't know if that's correct English. Is that right English? You can, you can correct me. English is not my first language, so you must, you must forgive me. So every time you borrow, you are making yourself a slave. Now let me explain why, why you become a slave. <laughs> A slave does not choose when, when he works or when he doesn't work. The master tells you, you must work, finish and clap. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So, Bazaar, whenever you wake up and you go to work, whether Mama Tunjua is at the school, whether it's me, uh, wherever I work, wherever it's Bab Malina, whoever it is, when you go and work, mm -hmm. if you have borrowed, 
You don't work for yourself alone. You work for yourself and your slave master. Are you with me, Bazaar? Because whatever you get when you work, he's got a rightful portion, legally so, in whatever you do. Whatever you get, he's got a portion, whether you like it or not. You can't say, I don't want to pay you this month. You have to, because you are a slave. And not only are you going to pay him back what he borrowed you, you have to pay him more than what he borrowed you. Mm. I was a, there was one, one thing I posted in my, in my DP a few, few months ago, that urban slaves are not in chains, they are in debt. Mm. I was a, mm. God does not want us to be in debt because he knows that whenever you are in debt, you become a slave. You slave for 10 hours there. Your slave master, whose name is Absa, whose name is Truex, whose name is Edgars, whose name is MTN, is sitting waiting for you to work for them. They don't have to work. They just have to wait for you to work for them. A slave works for someone else while they relax. Hi there, Amen. You work, you sweat. And then month end, they don't even have, they don't even ask. Automatically, it comes off of your bank account. Mm -hmm. That's why some people, you know what they do. You know, I, 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 this is one. This was this was shared by one uh, one person who was who came to share uh, a message at Christ Rock Bible Church. It says sometimes because this guy has got so much right to you, man. Some people, when it's twelve, when it's twelve o one, they are mm -hmm. waiting at the ATM. Mm -hmm. So that when the money comes in, they withdraw everything. Because they know if they wait, the owner will come and get everything. Are you with me, Bazaar? Urban slaves in debt. Highly ever Amen. And I'm saying this thing is it, it, it's it's okay. It's become okay for us. It's become okay. And let me give you reasons why God does not want us to be in debt, Bazaar. This is something we all have to work at as a church. God does not want us to be in debt because we are slaves. I, I, I can go on for a whole day just describing how we are slaves when we are in debt. But number two, debt will keep you in bondage and will limit your movement for the kingdom of God. Let me explain what I'm trying to say. I'm saying to be in debt will keep you in bondage and will limit your movements for the kingdom of God. Now, let me give you an example. Here's a house that I live in. This house is under a bond. Are you with me, Amen. If the Lord tells me, he comes, comes to me here in my bedroom and he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he says, my son, I want you to go and become a missionary in the land of Mauritius. I want you to live tomorrow. You know that I can't live as a... I've got slave masters that I need to service first before I can respond to the word of the Lord. I have to say, oh Lord, please let me finish paying off this house first. Please let me finish paying off this and that. I can't do things for the kingdom because I'm in debt. I with Bazan. I can't move. Bazan, you know, this is why I understand why some, some, some men of God who've been preaching in my life have been saying, you must live with a tent mentality in your heart. Such that when the Lord says you must move tomorrow, you must be ready to move. Are you with me, Bazan? You know, so many times Jesus says, come and follow me. And they said, yeah, we want, still want to go and borrow my, bury my mother. I want to. You are not ready for the kingdom. If you've got things that are tying you back. Now I have to pray for him to give me a breakthrough. Now I have to pray for him to let me win the lotto. So I can pay off the house before I can go and become a missionary. Mm. We can't serve the Lord fully when we are, when we are bound by debt. We can't. That's just the reality. Debt will limit us in how we respond. The Lord will say to you, 
give to this project. Ah, but dad, I, I must pay for Absa. I must pay for my car. I must pay for this. You can't respond because you know there are people who are, who are more entitled to your money than the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Amen. There are people who are more entitled to your money and your resources than the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, Amen. It keeps us in bondage. Number three, debt forces us to enter into this world system. It forces us. But then, debt is not just debt. You don't understand. Debt is a world system. And it's not a system that comes from the kingdom that you belong to. Are you with me, Bazala? It's not, it's not of, of it's not, Bazala. Let me, let me try and prove to you that the, the debt system that they've designed is created so that you conform. You know that when you want to buy a house, when you want to buy a car, when you want to have a I don't know anything. What's the first thing that they look at? Credit. They look at your credit record. Mm. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So some people will even say to you, as soon as you start working, just have a small account or something so that you can build your <coughs> credit record. You know, there was a, there was, there's a lady um, who, is, uh, who, is, who, is, who is one of our business partners. She has no debt, Razala. None. She owes no one nothing. 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 Cars, houses, everything. She owes no one. So she says when her daughter, I think, was ready to go to university, she wanted to get her contract with MTN, one of these things. And she says, you know, I've, when I went there, they declined my application mm -hmm. because they said I've got no credit record. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, Razala? A person who owes no one nothing can't get credit because they don't have a credit record. It's a system of the world. It's meant to suck you in. It's meant to draw you in so that you are used to living. This is the way of the world. We are used to it. Everyone is doing it. Therefore, I must also do it. Before you know it, you've got so many debts that you are even borrowing money to eat the food that's on your plate. It's a system of this world. And it's not of our kingdom, Bazala. Hallelujah, Bazala. Oh, Bazala, it limits how you can serve God. Because I can tell you when you're in debt and, you're, and your boss, whoever your boss is, says to you, uh, we are working for the next six months, we are working seven days a week. You can't say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not coming And this. You can't say that because you know if you don't, creditors will be on your back. I you with me, Bazaar? You know, so you have to, you have to serve your credit. And by the way, the Bible says it's, it's our duty to pay our creditors. So the Bible says if you do go in debt, then you must pay them. Because you, are, you are, will be sending a bad message about Christianity and Christians if you don't pay them. So you must pay them. So it limits how you can serve God, Bazan. Hallelujah. Amen. It limits your kingdom investments. You know very well, Bazan. You know. And, and they, you know, we teach about these things. We teach about offering. We teach about tithes. And I believe in my heart. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I believe in my heart. Brethren want to offer and they want to tithe. They just can't. Are you with me, Bazan? They want to give, they want to offer, they want to tithe, they just can't do it. Because this money is held everywhere except in the kingdom of God. How was that? Amen. Am, I, am I being too harsh? No. I'm not being too harsh. Am I okay? Yes. Can I go deeper? <laughs> Say, man, go deeper, man. <laughs> <laughs> we don't operate like that here. It's not that kind of, not that kind of church. 
Hallelujah, Brother Amen. The system of debt is meant to teach you to be impatient. God says one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. The spirit of death is meant to teach you to be impatient so that you can have it now. You can't wait for it. I can't save for it. I want it and I want it now. The spirit of death allows you so that you are impatient. I want the cell phone and I want it now. How much is it? 10,000. Ah, no, I can't wait. I'll go and commit myself to a 24-month contract. Because death is meant to teach you to be impatient. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying as a church, I'm saying as by faith Christian church, we need to start looking at debt and we need to start hating debt. My wife knows that one of the things I always tell her, I tell her, I hate debt. Bazaar. I hate it. It's a burden. It's a weight. I just hate, I don't like debt. I, I just don't like it. And we need to have this same mentality as a church. Because we are no longer in Egypt. We are no longer in Egypt. And by the help of God, we are going to look at practical things and practical ways of things that we can do so that we can get rid of this problem in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to start seeing it as a system that we need to avoid at all costs. Hallelujah. Amen. It mustn't be just a norm. Are you with me, Mazal? It mustn't be a norm. You know, Mazal, I mean, I let, let me say this. I wanted to say this in later weeks, but to just show that this thing has become a norm. And remember, I'm talking about Egypt and how they used to think and how God had to change their way of thinking. And what I'm going to say now is, I've shared this before and I'll share it again, Mazal. But when I was 18 years old, when I started uh, in, in tertiary education, I was all alone in Deben. And I remember that there, there were people from Edgars who came to offer us clothing accounts as students. And I think they still do this thing. And I remember that I was so excited for this opportunity to have a clothing account. It was normal for me, but it was normal for me that we buy clothes on credit. It was normal. Why? Because it was something that I was used to. Remember, we spoke about that. We spoke about things that we've gotten used to. I had grown up, and I don't blame my parents. It's all that they knew. It's all that Bazan. We, we can't blame our parents because it's where they operated. It's all that they knew at the time. It was normal. Everyone in the head gas account. In the 80s and 90s, same as house account. It was normal, Bazaar. And no one looked down on you for having an account. Instead, it was something that looked good. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So, even when I was 18 and when I was offered an account, I felt I've arrived in the world. I've got a card with my name, my name on it. <laughs> PL Gongshe, me, a card. It's a system, Basala. It's a system. It, it never occurred to me that it's wrong for me to have an account where I don't even have an income, Basala. I had no income. It did not occur. How was I going to pay for those clothes? But I just took the account. It's a system, Basala, that we need to get rid of and avoid at all costs. We need our minds to be what, Basala? To be renewed. Hallelujah, Bazaar. Hesh, if I were to advise you, if you were starting out in life, maybe let me speak today. Is it 12 o'clock already? I must stop. Hish, okay, let me stop. Um, and, and stop by saying this. If you are a young person, if you are just, you know, for those who are, uh, are young, are starting out in life, if I were to give you advice, I mean, this is the best advice I can give you as far as your finances are concerned. When you start out in life, make up your mind. Make up your mind as a child of God. The first thing I will do, I will honor God with the tithe. Are you with me, Bazaar? That's the first thing that 
Remember, Bazani, when you start working, you've got no debt, you've got no, co you've got no commitments, you've got no, you are starting from scratch. I'm, I'm now talking in a perfect world, Ali Bazani. I know that sometimes when we start working, some have already got children, some, I know. But I'm just talking about in a perfect world. If you were 22, starting out in the working world without a child, without a husband or anything, I would advise you, learn early to honor God with your tithe. Just get yourself used to the fact that I live off of 90%. It's not mine. Just, just make yourself used to that. That's the first thing. The second thing I would tell you to do is to put 10% aside for yourself. Are you with me, Mazan? Don't use it. Save it and invest it just for yourself. I'm telling you, Mazan, anyone who will ever take this advice, you will never regret it. I'm telling you, it's an advice you will never, ever regret. Get yourself used to this thing. Honor the Lord with 10% and put 10% aside for yourself. You will see with the passing of time, you will come back and thank me later and say, you know what? That advice that you gave me is the best advice you ever gave me. And let me tell you, some of you say, ah, but men of God, you don't know how hard things are. I know how hard things are. I know how difficult things are. But let me tell you something. And I've, I, you know, these, these same examples keep, keep on coming back in my mind. You see, as I wake up every day and I go to work, my wife has got this, this small business. She sells perfumes and she sells clothes. And if I were to lose my job tomorrow, no work, do you know that I'm not going to die? Do you know that my wife is not going to die? Do you know that my children are also not going to die? Do you know that, Baza? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I might lose this house. <laughs> maybe I might lose this house. But I won't die. I can promise you that. None of my children will die of starvation. I really Baza. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we, 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 there are certain things in our lives that we have made them necessities. When if you really look down into it, it's not a necessity. <laughs> There are things that we have become used to. Hey, this, this thing of used to, Mama told you that you started, is going to become a theme for us. There are things that we've become used to that are not necessary. If some of those things you were to start to cut off, you will start to realize some cash flow in your life. You know, I'm not saying we mustn't be beautiful, but certain things we can do without for a season, for a season, just to fix our lives. Yes, you look nice when your lips are red. Yes, I know, but you can do without that for a season while we are trying to deal with this ugly thing called death in our lives, Basara. Are you with me, Basara? You know, one of the things I, I, I've, I've said, and, and this is something I've endeavored to do, I've said, you know, I'd much rather have a few clothes that look nice than to have a wardrobe full of things that are just okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Baza? Yeah. You know, so I always say, I always say when, when we go shopping, I always say, when you go to the shop and you go to look for a shoe, don't bring back a shoe because you said, I'm going to buy a shoe, even when you don't find something you don't like. That you, does that make sense, Baza? Because yeah. some people, when they go out to, to shop, they have to bring something, even if they didn't find something they liked. <laughs> Are you with me, Bazaar? Come back, save your money, and get something that you like. Yes, yes, yes. And then I have five nice shirts, mm. two nice trousers, and then, then we have 10, 15 trousers that I don't like, even when I pull them out. I don't even wear them. Are you with me, Bazaar? Yes. These are small things that we need to start doing in our lives yes. to get rid of this ugly thing, Bazaar. Do you really need an iPhone? Really? You know that thing costs, I don't know how much in you, how much is a new iPhone, iPhone now? 30,000 rand. Do you really need that thing? You don't need it. You don't, you don't need it. 
And there was an, we must be careful. We must be careful. We are trying to build one another here. We are trying to build one another here. We are not looking down on anyone. No one. You must not live here feeling down. We are not looking. We are building. We are here to build one another. Amen. We, are, we are children of the Most High God and we belong to His kingdom. Amen. And the best of this world belongs to us. Amen. And I'm saying part of dealing with some of the problems is to acknowledge that we are part of the problem. Some of our choices are part of the problem that we find ourselves in. Are you with me, Mazal? Amen. When you see these children of mine carrying these cell phones, these iPhones, and you say, no, but I also want my children to have iPhones, you must first find out where does he get that iPhone. Did your father buy you that phone? You'll find, I've never bought a cell phone for any of my children. But what happens is, you know, my wife, when she gets a phone, when, that, when, when, that, when it's time for her to get a, a new phone, it gets passed down to the children. Mm -hmm. So when your wife sees them and he says he's got an iPhone, he says he needs it. He must then buy it for himself if he needs it. If he's got a need, he must buy it for himself. You mustn't look at people and then think you want to emulate when you don't know what it is that they're doing. Run your own race, run in your own lane. The Lord knows what you need. The Lord knows what you need in your life. It's not a competition, Master. Do you know if you came to this church with one dress and one shoe every Sunday, we would not love you any less? Do you know that? It would not change the way. Because if we loved you on the basis of what you have, then we don't love you. Because of time, let me stop here, Basar. Let your kingdom come. That is our new series, Basar. Let his kingdom, let his kingdom be a reality in our lives. Let, let's not just hear about it, but let's live in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, Basar. That is what, that is the journey that we are starting. The first, the first thing that we are going to deal with is this issue of debt. Hallelujah, Basar. Are you going to walk with me, Basar? Are you going to love me even when I say nasty things to you? Amen. Because we're on a way to building ourselves. Amen. We're on a way to running the path Amen. that will lead us to freedom so we can serve the Lord in liberty. Hallelujah, Basar. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for speaking to us in this fashion. We say let your kingdom come in this church of yours. Let your kingdom come in all the families of the children who are under this ministry, my Father, and all their families who are outside. Father, we pray for your goodness and mercy to follow us. Thank you that you are reviving us through this message. Thank you that you are talking to us and making a way for us in Gosi, that we may live lives that are in liberty so that we can serve you. Our purpose and our wish is to serve you unhindered by the system of this world. Father, be glorified, be magnified, and let your precious light shine. Father, as your children leave this place today, let this word bother them. Let the things that have been spoken, let them speak to their hearts so that, Father, they can yearn to change this system that they've gotten used to. But, Father, usher them so that they can go into a place where they can get used to new things, that they can get used to better things because we have been saved and we have been called onto a better covenant with better promises. Let us leave the old covenant of bondage, but come into a, a covenant of liberty and freedom in your Son, Jesus Christ, and the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding how to navigate this life so that your name may be glorified. And Father, we pray that your kingdom may be a reality in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Amen.